Okay. Well, I don't want to go long and I want to keep everyone on schedule. So I think we will start. Thank you all for joining. We have uh, quite a large bunch of uh, registrants today. So uh, there's obviously a lot of interest in this space. I assume a lot of companies are thinking about putting together a policy or in the process of a policy or starting to roll it out. But given our client base, which is consumer products, advertising agencies, entertainment companies, tech platforms and tech companies, we thought we had a really good comprehensive view of all sides of the issue, especially because we've created our own policy that we're rolling out as well. Now, you may recall this is a follow up to some other presentations we have already done on AI, AI platforms navigating and the legal risks of creating advertising and entertainment uh, with myself, Ryan Martin and Lisa Wisnitzer, as well as the one we did a week or two ago on privacy issues in the use of AI with myself, Jessica Lee, Caroline Hudson and Eric Cook. We do have recordings of both. So if you miss them, I do think you'd learn a lot from them if you have the time. So just email one of the presenters today and we can provide you the recordings. This is being recorded now, so you can review it later. Um, the slide deck, I actually tried to use AI to create the slide deck and it turned into a little bit of a disaster. So we went back to our standard slide deck. Um, but I recommend here you take a lot of notes because we're going to be given a lot of golden nuggets, especially Liz, no pressure, Liz. Uh, CLE will be provided uh, code uh, halfway through and at the end. And that's just for lawyers who need CLE in New York, Illinois, Tennessee, DC, California, where we have offices. And ethics credit pending uh, should be given as well for, for a half an hour. So today, what we've kind of learned through our process and through helping out a number of different clients, the way to do this right is it takes a team to put this together that's comprehensive, but also thoughtful and practical. Anyone can put together a policy that just says don't use AI, um, but to really have it thoughtful, I think you need a whole team. And that's why in creating our policy, we had technology attorneys like Liz, we have people from the marketing group like myself. We had privacy attorneys like Shelly Berry, who's going to be speaking today. We have our general counsel involved, who Michael Zweig, who's been involved in our policy as well. And just as important, those from the business side, like our firm information officer, David Lampert. Um, so all of those parties today are going to get together and try to, to hash this out for you. There's our pictures, by the way. Liz. Show them who I am before I dive in. Um, <laughs> so the reason why we're all here, right? Um, why is an AI use policy important? Um, so with all the news around this right now, I don't think that it. we really have to convince this group uh, joining this call why an internal AI use policy could be helpful. Um, however, we've highlighted just a few points here, uh, including risk and reputational management, legal compliance, and both legal and non-legal ethical responsibility. Um, so we'll highlight some of the risks associated with the use of AI a bit later on in the presentation, but I think the important thing to think about with respect to drafting a policy is that an internal policy gives your company the chance to actually assess the risks that are most relevant to your business um, and focus on training and instruction around the issues that really matter for your company and your particular users and use cases. Um, obviously, uh, if your company is going to permit use of AI, you'll want to address legal compliance. Um, and a policy allows you and your company to assess your risk tolerance, put appropriate guardrails in place to try and avoid missteps that could damage the company's reputation or cause legal or other issues. Um, with a policy in place, uh, the company can also ensure consistent practices across different AI pro projects and teams. Um, and it's a helpful way to provide transparency to employees, um, including your legal team, uh, and if appropriate, also third-party vendors or your customers about your company's use of AI, including uh, your approach to AI technologies and also um, how you're using them responsibly and thoughtfully. Um, and it can also include training programs to enhance understanding and that sort of thing. 
Um, transparency and accountability. So an AI policy can promote transparency, obviously providing guidelines on use, um, but also it can outline the roles and responsibilities of various stakeholders involved in AI projects. So that can hold them accountable for their actions and decisions. Um, bias and discrimination avoidance, obviously AI technologies can have significant ethical implications related to discrimination and biases. Um, so an AI use policy helps to establish guidelines and principles for responsible and ethical use of AI, including educating employees about how AI can introduce or amplify biases. So obviously data privacy and security and confidentiality issues are paramount. And that's one of the best reasons to put together uh, a policy to make sure that, you know, we, we have seen big brands already embarrassing the public by employees going on ChatGPT and putting in confidential data. And, and you don't want that, obviously, to hand, happen to your company as well. Um, I will say, though, looking at uh, and another issue, looking at the FTC's recent um, guidelines on testimonial endorsements, they gave something that I thought was really interesting when you consider their view of policies, as well as state AGs and local district attorneys. And when the updated uh, guidelines came out, the FTC specifically clarified that basically, in a nutshell, companies should have policies and plates that place that cover its obligations regarding endorsements and testimonials. And they said, while not a safe harbor, that having a policy and following the policy should reduce the incidence of deceptive claims and reduce an advertiser's odds of facing a commission enforcement action. Obviously, that was about uh, uh, testimonials and endorsements, but I think it just goes to show a general regulator's view. Um, you might say, though, do we really need a policy? Like, we don't have a policy about how employees use Google. And I think that is a point, and it is a lot of work if, to put together a policy and to do it right. So I think depending upon your risk tolerance, the size of your company, there's a lot of different factors. We're not telling you here that you have to have a policy. I think being on this webinar and thinking through these issues, whether it's right for you, is, is, is great. And then, of course, legal ethics. Uh, for your lawyers, having a policy for lawyers definitely probably does make sense, at least to set expectations for them. Um, you know, your legal department's going to want to be using uh, this. In fact, clients are potentially pushing law firms to use it to uh, get cost savings. Uh, but we want to make sure that, that the lawyers in your group understand their ethical obligations. And we'll top, dive into this topic in a little bit uh, at, at the end with Michael. So initial considerations, as I said, it's taken a team like we have on the call today to develop our own firm policy. Who's on your team? It could be human resources. It could be your chief marketing officer, your chief operating officers, or their representatives as well. Um, other groups who use AI and have their own unique practical perspective to bring to the table that, you know, the team might, of lawyers especially, that might not otherwise appreciate, including possibly outside counsel to not only bring their unique perspective, but also to keep their discussions possibly attorney client privilege. Now, of course, often too many cooks, you know, can spoil the broth. So you might have like a core team to prepare the policy and then widen it out broader to others who might have some great input because too many people on the team could obviously be a, a, a problem. What we're seeing from clients Every client is kind of taking its own path to creating a policy. Some aren't even policies. Some are notes where we've gotten something from a client that said, here is our expectation about what you are going to do with our data. It wasn't something that we had to sign. They didn't say that, um, you know, we were bound by contract to it. It was just telling us their expectations. Some have come running out and announced their, po uh, their, their, policy, uh, their policies publicly. Um, others are kind of taking a more holistic approach. And before taking pen to paper, we have some clients that are kind of doing fact gathering where they're interviewing various stakeholders to determine how they may use AI, how they are currently using it, and then undertaking a risk analysis to kind of decide where to spend the resources to 
and the greatest risk to deal with at that time. Because as you can see, we're going to talk about here, you could have a policy for your employees, for your vendors, for your lawyers, for your software developers, for your agencies. You can't do that all at once. So you may want to identify what risks are out there and who's the most important to create a policy for at that time. Yeah, and I think um, this is still on the last slide, Brian, but I think another like part of that fact finding process, potentially, if that's the route you're going to go is thinking about what AI tools are out there and also thinking about um, or maybe even collecting information from employees, departments, etc. Um, about what tools they'd like to use. Um, I think we're all hearing a lot about, you know, ChatGPT and other generative AI apps, um, GPT-4, GitHub Copilot, Bard, uh, apps like that, that are, you know, at everyone's, you know, forefront of everyone's mind. And I think, you know, a lot of clients are crafting policies specifically to deal with use of those sorts of tools. But obviously there's, you know, other AI applications out there, and some of them might be in business tools your teams are already using. So um, going through that process of even just defining the universe of what tools uh, that either, you know, are AI specific tools or tools that feature AI or have an AI functionality, um, that can be an onerous process, but might be just a helpful, you know, to just sort of step to gauge where your company is and where you want to go when you're crafting a policy and also defining the scope of that policy of, of what that's going to cover. Um, so this slide, uh, just a few additional uh, additional considerations. Um, you can consider whether your policy is going to remain internal, which would be you know an employee facing policy only or maybe provided to third parties uh, or maintained in a public facing manner. So, um, if you're a company that commonly acts as a service provider to customers, for example, uh, you might maintain a version of your policy that you can provide to your clients if they ask for it. Um, but, you know, in doing that, you'll want to remember that whatever you're going to provide either publicly or to customers might not be considered confidential. Um, and it's obviously not subject to attorney client privilege. So if you're drafting that sort of a policy, you might take into consideration that, you know, you're not going to include long analysis of risks you're willing to take or anything like that. Um, it wouldn't really be in your best interest to in disclose as much information as you might in an internal policy. Um, also, you might consider things like length of your policy. A uh, shorter policy could actually uh, encourage your employees to read the, um, the policy. Um, of course, on the other hand, a longer, more comprehensive policy uh, is able to go into more detail, uh, provide more um, you know, lower level guidance to your employees about use and that sort of thing. Um, you just have to do a bit of a cost benefit analysis to the two. Um, and then as part of considering who your policy is for, uh, think about whether a single policy will apply sort of across the board to your employees and other AI users, um, or if it makes sense to do different policies for vendors, as Brian was talking about before, um, or maybe there's, you know, heightened sensitivity around users who have access to certain data or to certain systems, um, or maybe you have a separate policy that applies to your lawyers, that applies to your developers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, we talk a lot about AI, but mostly what we are talking about is generative AI. And it may be that your policy is just about generative AI. And of course, generative AI, as opposed to machine learning or kind of the broad scope of AI, is something that has the ability to create new content, such as like images or text or music or, you know, like virtual worlds, uh, based upon patterns and examples that it has seen before. Um, you probably, in within your company, you have many software programs that use AI that have probably been going on for quite a while. So the broad scope of this applies to AI might be much too broad for what you really want to do. So I do really think you need to have that conversation. The other conversation that you really need to have to discuss is pre-approved tools, AI tools. Are you going to pre-approve any AI tool that your companies use? Or is it only tools 
uh, are, are people going to be allowed to use the kind of public version of chat GPT? One option is to say, well, you can use the public version of these tools, but you cannot include any of our trademarks, any of our confidential data, any PII, and you have to turn off all kind of privacy controls or turn on privacy controls and turn off all training data um, if you if you are using these publicly available. And then if you want to use sensitive proprietary data within AI, then maybe you only use pre-approved tools. And those would be tools that somebody like David from our group would analyze and take a look at and determine whether they're uh, appropriate. Uh, and only after being vetted would you allow those within your system and allow to be input confidential and proprietary data. And, and David, I, I assume you're kind of going through that thought process now for our company. That's correct. And, and you know, we don't go too far outside of the, the playbook that existed before AI, which is we always evaluate third parties for risk, working with other third party providers that help us manage that risk assessment. We want to make sure that they're up to date with these new systems and how they assess the, the new risks that come along with AI and generative AI. Um, we do typically draw the line between uh, secured and unsecured um, with public and then what we maintain internally. Um, you know, some of these platforms will ingest a lot of data, and that's where the biggest risk exists. So um, from an internal perspective, is it ingesting data? Is it just analyzing things? Is there no data that's a part of that platform? And those are things that kind of de-escalate or escalate the risk when we assess uh, these products. And I can assure everyone on this call, if any of you are clients, that you know we are certainly taking the pol the, uh, the policy <laughs> that uh, sensitive client information, personal information, trademarks of clients, content of clients, or any information of, of client uh, cannot be used in any AI uh, until such time as we can allow it into our system and, and, and feel like we have appropriate protections at, at, at that time. Um, Liz, you wanna talk about some of the potential risks of AI and, and I think everyone kind of knows and has heard, obviously, if they've seen either of our presentations about the risk facing AI, but some of the things that you can address in a, in a policy. Yeah, I was just going to say, I think um, probably this isn't uh, the first AI presentation anyone is attending. So we're not going to do a deep dive into the risks, though we will highlight a few in, in just a minute here. Um, but, you know, when you think about use of AI, especially for internal projects and protecting your company, you know, you're thinking of things like um, security, privacy, um, IP infringement, confidentiality issues possible discrimination, reputational damage, and on and on and on. Um, but like we said towards the beginning of the presentation, what you want to do when you're writing a policy is really, you know, look at the landscape of risk out there and figure out, you know, what risks really are important to your company or what risks are particularly likely um, in the context in which you want to use AI tools. Um, and then you can actually focus your policy in those areas rather than, you know, going off on a long tangent about something that's never going to apply to your, <laughs> your business um, and freaking everybody out. So you really have that ability to identify the risks that are important, hone in on them and provide um, meaningful guidance to your employees that actually applies to them. Um, so for example, if your company is very sensitive to use of AI and maybe you take the approach like David was just talking about really vetting tools um, proactively, only allowing specific use, and maybe you're even going to say, you know, we're going to host any AI uh, in-house, we're going to, you know, run our own security, um, you know, practices and be able to put the controls in place that we want, um, then your policy is not necessarily going to focus too much on cybersecurity, confidentiality risks, and those sort of things, because you're able to control that in your environment. So you can see how that sort of will shape your policy. Whereas if you're going to take a very permissive approach and say, sure, employees go ahead and use these tools, um, even the publicly available ones, then you actually might have a lot more guardrails you put in place around things like confidentiality, security, privacy, et cetera, um, because you're taking that more permissible route and actually relying on your employees to read the policy, understand their responsibility and the risks, um, and make those decisions. So one really interesting additional risk, as we just talked about with David, 
you can't right now a lot of people are just using third party publicly facing AI tools, right? And we're seeing that those tools are getting sued left and right uh, for using the data to train and inform the tool, right? They're getting sued for copyright infringement. They're getting sued for defamation. But those are all third-party tools. And as a user, you're unlikely to get, get sued. We just saw the FTC announce an investigation of OpenAI, the company who runs ChatGPT, for uh, def uh, concerns over defamation and it concerns over training using personal information. So what happens, and David, maybe you could, um, when we want to create our own internal AI system or bring a third-party system under our house, right? And now we're going to try to train that data do we face those, obviously, we still, we face those same infringement risks that all these companies are getting sued for now. So it seems to me, you do want to think about, do you actually want to create your own internal AI system? Um, and if you do, how are you going to train that without subjecting yourself to infringement claims? Yeah. So from my perspective, um, we would start with the business and review of our outside counsel guidelines and what we may or may not be required to do in terms of leveraging uh, data for such platforms. I think if you talk about general systems where we're not ingesting data and we're just using tools for analysis or maybe better security, um, it's still early days, even though we know it's gonna speed up very quickly. Um, my preference is we align with the providers that we're most significantly aligned to. So we would start with Microsoft because we're largely a Microsoft shop. And then we would use the tools within our tenancy. So we don't want public tools, we want private tools. Um, and then from there, um, whether it's assisting us like on the security side, but, but we already know that that's not quite there yet, having you know met extensively at Microsoft on what AI assisted security looks like. We know that for other platforms like logging and things like that, it, there's already some AI assistance that just provides better uh, detection and response, which is what we want, particularly if we're up against threat actors with leveraging AI tools. Um, so, you know, it's it's a big discussion. And then, of course, you know, we talked about policies, policies of our clients, pol our internal policies. Um, we want to make sure that our security tools are aligned to those policies, because if you don't have controls aligned to those policies and from a security side, it, it really doesn't make a difference. We're not doing our job. So we have to make sure that that's all in check. And then we just follow general good change management process, proof of, proof of value with the business, um, just to further vet these things to understand if it's if it's what we're after, what it's gonna take to, to adequately protect it and, and leverage those platforms. So Michael Zweig, our general counsel, I'll put you on the spot real quick. So hearing that all these third-party platforms are getting sued all over the place for, you know, their own programs, which are using training data uh, or data to train their models, are you going to let us create our own internal AI systems that may expose us to similar risk? <laughs> Not a question you asked me before, Brian. Uh, <laughs> I, oh, it just came to mind. I, I, you know, it's, it's a fair question. I, I think we're going to have to look at it very closely. Uh, I think we're going to have to consider where the risk of copyright infringement or defamation may, may arise before we start using it, uh, given that lawyers and law firms are prime targets uh, for plaintiff's lawyers. Yeah, and I think that's uh, something actually just occurred to me, and I don't think a lot of companies are thinking about when they're starting to create their own AI models, um, but there are tons of lawsuits out there, so you know you don't necessarily want to be party to that. I do see a question here from Dave Block. I don't know if this is the Dave Block I used to uh, work with, but if it is, thanks for the question. If the law firm verifies proofreads and confirms the output from generative AI is accurate and on point, why would a law firm need to have a policy? Shouldn't the quality control regime, regime for generative AI be identical to the procedures for the firm? That's what I was saying a little bit at the beginning. Not every company and firm definitely needs a policy. But one, I go back to that FTC point that I made that regulators, uh, even a court, I think would love to see that you had a policy. And then you can say, hey, yeah, this one employee, they didn't follow the policy, but we may have a policy. We train people on the policy. We updated the policy. That's going to certainly help companies from uh, looking bad, from having uh, you know, uh, from having interest in a regulator coming after them or for some sort of, you know, extra damages. 
Um, I would also say that there's just, yes, in a perfect world, that is correct. But the problem is many employees, uh, many people out there, they don't really understand AI yet. And it certainly makes sense to tell them in your policy, yes, people should know, don't put confidential data in a AI prompt. Do a Google search, you're going to see many brands already have had that problem. So obviously, employees don't know. Employees don't know that these third-party uh, platforms can be infringing. If you Google for articles, ChatGPT from time to time has potentially created an infringing con content. People don't realize that. People also don't necessarily realize the importance of taking the content that an AI model does and transforming it into something original so it doesn't infringe. People don't understand that these platforms retain ownership of the content you create. They don't understand that um, they allow third parties to use the content you create. They don't even look at their terms and conditions and realize that these platforms provide you no protection, no insurance, no warranties, no indemnities. So all of these things uh, are additional risk considerations that you may want to put into your uh, your policies, including reminding people that, as we have seen, these AI, AI uh, platforms have made a lot of mistakes, and that's why they're getting sued for defamation and various other uh, types of causes of action. And I think um, having that all in your policy, all of those points are great things for your employees to uh, be advised about and that you can tell a court or a regulator, hey, this was all in our policy. This one guy screwed up, but that was uh, just one person. Everybody else is doing well following him. Uh, Liz. Okay. Yeah, we'll just hit this one quick because I think we've covered it a little bit, but we talked about at the beginning, you know, defining your policy objectives and the intent of your policy. Um, we talked about, you know, how will you allow your employees to use AI if you do at all? Um, and so defining those questions uh, and figuring out where you're going to be on those gating issues um, will define sort of the rest of the tone of your policy. So, you know, if you have a very permissive approach um, where employees can use AI, that will take a different tone for your policy than if you want to actually prohibit use. Uh, and and have folks get permission before using any AI tools, that obviously will, will be a fully different tone. Of course, um, a lot of thought goes into these questions. You know, do you have a process for vetting tools that makes sense? Like, can you handle uh, that extra work that goes into that, um, you know, and that sort of thing. But but that these questions will sort of form the rest of your policies approach. Um, and then there's also some uh, kind of guiding principles, I think, that you might consider as you're crafting your policy. You know, what's your focus? Um, fairness, transparency, accountability, uh, bias mitigation. As you're thinking about your company's um, approach to use of AI and also, you know, your overarching um, company guiding principles, those can work their way into how your employees use this technology, just like everything else you do. Um, and of course, legal or regulatory requirements will, will be a consideration, data privacy and security, and all the other risks we highlighted that are present for your company as well. So when you're creating a policy, defining these terms, probably a good idea, at least some of these terms. Uh, Policy is only as good as, as those people who understand it. I'm sure you can get definitions from chat GPT on each of these things pretty easily. <laughs> yes. Um, did you want to skip that one, Brian? The this one? Key components. Sure. Uh, we're skipping that one. Or I'm asking if you wanted to. Or we can go. Uh, no, shall we? Yeah, go back. Oh. <laughs> okay. Oh, sorry. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so we'll we'll hit it quick though, because I know everyone wants to talk about privacy and have Shelly talk and not me and Brian anymore. Um, but maybe hey, speak for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Um, but just a quick hit on components of an AI use policy. Um, you know, this kind of, this slide kind of just shows you that there are you know people think oh what are we covering in this policy and there really is a, at least going through our process of creating a policy there really 
you know, were many steps and we ended up with uh, with sections addressing a lot of topics. Um, and I think obviously super important to a law firm was uh, defining the data set we're dealing with. So what's confidential, what's sensitive information, you know, personal information, and it really defining those categories. I think that's probably an important one for any company that's going to allow use of AI is really just, you know, making people aware of the information that you have and what is and is not appropriate uh, when crafting uh, prompts for using AI. Um, just to hit a few more, I guess, um, establishing metrics and monitoring mechanisms. So this is sort of a feedback loop um, for users of AI. You know, you want to monitor use, but we also have towards the end of this list, um, communication back, incident reporting back, um, so you can have policies in your policy or in guidelines in your policy dealing with both, you know, downward monitoring, but also incident reporting and communication back upward um, to kind of make sure you're understanding how these tools are being used. And also since it's such a quickly evolving space that might change. Um, and, and that also dovetails into, you know, letting users know that the policy will be updated um, and keeping your working group accountable for making those updates and keeping apprised of changes that need to be made. Um, and then of course, um, you know, things like training, education, that can all be covered by the policy and flow down to users. So we're gonna move to the, the risks of privacy and how we think about privacy. But before we do that, David, we had a really interesting question. Uh, Best way to prevent generative AI tools from scraping our site, your site, a company's site, uh, and using that to train its own platform. Is there really a way? I know you can put some text uh, in the metadata to kind of say you don't want ro robots scrolling it, but does that really work? I mean, we are working with our web services providers to, to uh, eliminate the ability to scrub that content. So I, I think the best answer is just whether you manage that internally or you manage that with an external service, or you should be talking to them about achieving that objective for sure. And then you can always, I guess on the security side, if you're monitoring dark web and things like that, and you were to see that information floating out there and in other forums where it shouldn't be, that would be one indicator. But generally the, the service or, uh, or your web authority should be managing that for you already. And, and oftentimes you might, you may just have to ask. Got it. So, Shelly, um, can you talk to us a little bit about, as you are creating your policy, what are the kind of privacy implications that, that you want to think about when, in creating a, 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 your policy? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to try to, to go through uh, this pretty quickly because that's a super loaded question. I could talk about privacy and AI literally all day long. Um, oh, please, please do. That would be super interesting to me. <laughs> I'm sure it would be. Yeah. Um, but, you know, just wanted to take a couple of the highlights and just note that these aren't all of the key considerations, but sort of the blanket ones that once you start pulling on the thread, it'll start uh, disclosing other things that you need to think about as well as you talk about privacy and AI. Um, you know, also note that a lot of what I'm going to talk about here is going to apply whether you're building these AI tools internally for your own data sets or whether you're going to a vendor um, and using data from data brokers or, or, you know, data that's being scraped from the web. These are things you're going to want to think about. Uh, this is also going to help you to vet the privacy and security of these tools. Again, whether you're building them yourself or going to a vendor. Um, we sort of talk about best practice being sort of a blanket prohibition against putting in personal information into our AI tools without additional layers of review and approval, maybe several layers of review and approval uh, if PI is starting uh, to be used within those tools. And it also might be worth considering a, a blanket uh, prohibition against the use of de-identified and anonymous data that's derived from personal information because it's inherently a higher risk once you start ingesting it into AI tools because of the amount of data that already sits in there, the amount of data that's still to come. It makes re-identification um, a lot riskier and could also cause a problem for your de-identification data obligations under those US state comprehensive privacy laws that we all know and absolutely love. Um, so 
thinking about all of those implications with personal information, what can you do to sort of avoid that? There are alternatives to using personal information. We have a concept of synthetic data sets that can allow you to mimic real world experiences without using the personal information of specific individuals. Consider whether or not that's an alternative for you. And uh, another one would also be using AI tools that don't rely on mass amounts of data in order to be trained. We have this concept of reinforcement learning that allows sort of an AI to be trained based on positive, re, uh, positive reactions to what it's done rather than on, on going through and analyzing data with special and fabulous math. Um, another, another use is privacy enhancing technologies, which Brian has sort of talked about already, you know, having chat deletion functionality, uh, the ability to turn off the training and for other purposes, and using prompt engineering where possible, which is just the ability to direct AI to not respond to certain prompts. Uh, these are all things that you should consider adding into your uh, use policy. And it's also worth uh, making your personnel uh, aware that oftentimes these technologies, when you turn when you turn them on on one device or one browser, it doesn't necessarily translate to your other browsers and devices. So you need to make sure that functionality is turned on across uh, devices. And we also have this doesn't prevent um, browser add-ons and malware. So adding security measures, cybersecurity measures, is, is very important. Um, you also want to consider whether or not you want to use AI tools that have privacy and in, in, invasive default settings, whether or not you want to, to use those or whether you want to take special care to make sure that the default settings are turned off, especially oh, the Yeah, Shelly, I just want to hit something we didn't mention that that's a really good point. Um, like ChatGPT allows you to turn off uh, the the uh that that it can tr use your data to train right and the chat history and to the extent that um you i assume our advice is you would want to put in a policy that hey to the extent that those tools exist use them right yeah that's that's absolutely right and they're not always turned on to the benefit of the user, right? They're not always going to be privacy protective. So, you know, I, I uh, when I went into ChatGPT for the first time, I had to actually go into my own settings. There's there's no notice that says, hey, by the way, this is what we do with privacy, right? It's it's going to be in their privacy policy, which oftentimes the only ones who read them are the lawyers that that get to write them. Um, so yes, it's really important to sort of educate your personnel on sort of the the technologies that are out there and, and how to find them and how to make that part of your process. Um, there are also enterprise level subscriptions that you can take into account that offer a higher level of privacy protection and that might be something worth considering as well. Um, testing measures before and during the design is also vital to have in, in, your, in your use policy. Um, there's this concept of a black box where you have no insight into what uh, what data is going in and how outcomes are reached. And when you add personal information into that, it becomes even more complicated. And FTC has made it very clear that um, it's not a defense. A black box is not a defense to violating the law. So having testing uh, mechanisms in place that allow you to test the outcomes and review those outcomes using independent auditors to do that is very is something worth considering, especially the more sensitive the data gets. Um, privacy by design is also something else worth considering as it allows you to take privacy from the get go and put it all the way through your design instead of at the last minute trying to figure out how to build privacy into um, the AI tools that you're using or building. Um, and then one other thing too is the vendor questionnaires. We see these a lot. A lot of people have them, they provide them and ask people, ask vendors to fill them out with respect to uh, their security measures, the type of data that they're collecting and adding an AI component to that can go a long way to expediating this review process that we keep talking about in your use policies. Um, and then, you know, key personal information components, right? You've started adding personal information. You just want to have guidelines around how to do that. 
what is your process for complying with all the privacy and state security laws that might apply? Um, thinking about the fact that we might not have a comprehensive AI privacy law, but we've got a ton of privacy specific laws, um, both sectoral specific, global, that are, that are implicated the minute you start thinking about putting personal information. Um, and then data mapping is, uh, it, it's something that makes the process a lot easier. Privacy is very complicated today. Understanding the data flows to and from your AI tools is a vital component to making sure that everything else that you need to do um, is lined up. And finally, um, other guardrails to consider in the privacy space. One of the challenges with AI is that you're not always able to provide consumers with the proper notices and consents and what that risk entails based on that. Um, so, and if you're able to put in additional guardrails that can protect the consumer um, without being able to get their consent notice. Also consider bystanders protections and whether or not there are people who are not the intended users of AI, but are still having their personal information ingested somehow, whether it's through just a camera that happens to pick up another person um, or a voice that picks up another voice. You want to think about those bystanders. Also want to think about your in-person collection through retail stores and parking garages, malls and music venues, any AI that's used in those components and how you give notice and, and get consent. Um, and you also want to have a process to identify and address what the FTC calls their high-risk activities, such as uh, dark patterns and automation bias that influence people's beliefs and behaviors, especially in the, in, in the areas of finance and health and education and housing and employment. So if those areas are, 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 are factors that you are, are taking into consideration, um, it's definitely something to avoid without uh, putting additional guardrails in place. And Human oversight and involvement can, uh, and identifying gaps in your data sets goes a long way to reaching those transparency and um, accountability obligations, as well as avoiding bias and discrimination in your data sets. Right. Um, and of course, since we can't talk about privacy without talking about security, and because Brian hasn't put David on the spot enough this presentation, <laughs> um, we also wanted to, to touch on how to think about cybersecurity in the context of drafting an AI use policy. Um, so David, uh, just in case there's anything we haven't covered yet. Um, we wanted to give you the chance to talk a little bit about any other risks you think uh, would make sense to highlight for companies in thinking about you know, their policy drafting process. Right, so I mean, you touched on the outside council guideline piece, we touched on regulatory and compliance piece. Um, and then from a security perspective, we certify to the ISO 27001 um, information systems management uh, system framework. Um, so you might want to consider adding something like ISO 27701, um, which is the uh, privacy information management system. It's just that it would be an addendum to your current ISO policy and just force your, your team to focus on uh, data privacy and data governance. Um, and then, of course, again, my view, and I think it's a general view, is you start with the policies and then you align the controls. So ways that you would align controls to these policies is how you segment or isolate certain portions of data that may or may not be leveraged by the system, additional encryption needs, certainly on the pri uh, private information side, obfuscation or additional encryption tied to the systems that contain that data. Um, your data leakage uh, system may align a stricter classification of that data. And all that does is ensure that the data is optimized for any system that may be able to leverage it or not be able to leverage it. So you wanna tie those policy considerations to those controls. So when it comes time to leverage data, whether it's neutral, just analyzing it, or perhaps ingesting and training, you've already defined considering compliance, considering regulations, considering your, your, counsel, your outside counsel guidelines and considering your firm's view of how you wanna leverage a data or not leverage it. Um, and then, you know, AI assisted security, I touched on it earlier, as things speed up in the detect and respond space, they're speeding up in the threat actor space. Um, I think you'd probably be more likely to see nation states leveraging AI, in which case you 
he might be doomed anyway because it's a nation state. However, um, a good way to counter that would be to use AI assisted tools. Um, and as I've touched on, as we engage some of the providers, they're just getting there right now. Like this stuff just came upon us, let's say last, you know, Christmas. Um, and now um, in talking to those providers, you know, we're, we're learning how to identify that stuff. But if we keep it within our tenancy with Microsoft, who is our primary um, vendor in that space, then all of our tools naturally align to um, leveraging that AI managing our data, et cetera, because it's it's the Microsoft security suite that's protecting that environment. So um, I, I think that's why, that's one way you need to look at, you know, who is your cloud servicer or are you on premises? And in either case, I think Microsoft is applicable um, with the additional detection mechanisms. Um, and uh, again, just detect, aside from just the standard security, segmentation, encryption, AI assisted security, et cetera, um, you are uh, looking to effectively um, hide the things that you don't want to be seen and then ensure the things that you do, again, are aligned to those systems to be leveraged correctly. But if it's not organized data, you're, you're not even there, then you probably shouldn't even be having this conversation. So you have to get your house in order before you consider leveraging data uh, with AI systems. I think that's an absolute. Great. Thanks, David. So we've had a couple of questions on vicarious liability and secondary liability for users of uh, these AI third-party platforms. Um, we'll try to get that answered. Um, I'm actually putting out an article today or tomorrow on LinkedIn. So if uh, we don't get to it because of time, feel free to email me or look at my LinkedIn and there's an article that will address that. But I want to talk about vendor use policies. We've basically been talking about creating a policy for your own employees, but you may want to be creating, maybe an advertiser wants to create a policy for its agencies or some other type of vendor. So what are the things to think about that might be in those policies? And unfortunately, I'm going to go pretty fast, but some of the things to think about is one, that that policy is confidential and shouldn't be shared with third parties other than as is required for their performance of the agreement. What else should be in there? Well, if you are the creator of the policy, that it is binding on the recipient, regardless of whether or not they have signed that, um, and that the vendor bears all the risk of their use of AI unless agreed upon in writing. Obviously, now, if you're the vendor, like an advertising agency, you may take issue with that, and you should carefully read these policies provided by clients, address concerns you have immediately upon receipt of the policies, I would say, too often, an agency agrees to client policies that are buried kind of in a hyperlink in an agreement, and the business teams kind of glance at them, and they think they're non-negotiable because they seem standard. If you're the advertiser, that's a great way to bind them to the policy, but we want to make sure that our vendors, our agency clients are, are paying attention to that. Um, obviously, the fact that your freelancers may be using things like Jasper to create blog posts and things like that, because we've heard that so much. You really want to clarify that content uh, shouldn't be generated using AI, and that if it is, it needs to be transformed into original content, unless otherwise approved in advance. Now, what, how do you define transformation? Uh, courts have been trying to figure that out forever under the copyright law, but at the very least, you want to tip your, uh, your vendors, your freelancers off that, hey, if you are using this stuff, you really need to make it your own. Your policy should also talk about implicit bias. Make sure that the vendor should be considering those issues because the FTC is very concerned about that. Uh, the policy for your vendor should also note that their use of AI should abide by the company's and vendor's own privacy policy, as well as probably the client's privacy policy as well. It should remind uh, the vendors that use of AI doesn't obviate the need for normal legal clearance. 
the policy should also take into account the discussions we previously had for uh, the fact that AI generated material has been said by the Copyright Office that it cannot necessarily be ownable from a copyright perspective uh, and thus not protectable. So your policy does need to take that and into consideration. You need to decide as you did for your employees, are you going to require disclosure of AI or prohibit it or only allow approved tools? You want to clarify what a vendor can include in prompts. You want to tell the vendors to turn off the training tools. Now, uh, all of this should be self-evident. Go back to David Block's comment before isn't this just good business practice? Yes, but many of our vendors have young people doing the great bulk of the work. And in those instances, you want to really set forth and teach them. Um, you also might want to tell your vendors how to deal with noncompliance. And finally, the policy should reserve the right to revise the policy in the future by giving notice to the agency. So what about advertising agencies creating AI policies for their own employees? We've seen many policies being rolled out and publicly available, but what I see mainly from agencies is the policy is limited to don't use generative AI in, in, in final client materials, uh, but can maybe be used in other ways such as inspiration. But that seems to me leaving a lot of openness for the employees. Where do you draw that line? What's inspiration and what's final materials? And of course, we know that once you use something for inspiration and you show it to a client and they love it, you're probably going to go down that road. You're not going to be allowed by the client to change it substantially unless you have to have that awkward conversation with the client. Well, if you like it, we used AI and it could infringe, so you're going to have to take responsibility for it, client. Nobody wants to have kind of that discussion. An ad agency policy for its employees should cover other things. Again, remind employees they need to create original and non-infringing content. It needs to kind of think about what does the MSA between the client and the agency require and those ownership issues and the protectability issues, how is the agency going to deal with that? Uh, of course, ad agencies need to remind its employees to secure clients' data and PII as confidential um, and any other unique circumstances that are covered by kind of the MSA or the type of work that we're doing. Um, the Ad agency's policy for its employees probably includes freelancers, so it probably should have a special note for freelancers. Do not use uh, AI for this work without approval or without substantially transforming the work into uh, original uh, content. Um, and it should probably talk about kind of if we are going to go down the road of inspiration, it should probably talk and, and, and define the idea about the difference between pitching content to the client and the client specifically uh, requesting a platform to be used. If the client does, maybe more responsibility is on the, on the client there. The policy for agencies, turn off the chat history for your employees. We have seen a lot of decks created by AI, which use celebrities' names and likenesses. Even if it's not in final materials, we would recommend that your policy says don't input celebrities into your AI. It's just so dangerous because if celebrities are coming after you, they're not coming after you for five bucks. They're coming after you for five million. Those are just some of the things that an ad agency should think about when creating a policy for its own employees. But we did want to talk about that MSA agency client agreement. Obviously, whether you're the agency or a client, you should be developing provisions that are going to go in your MSA governing use of AI in the, the agency client agreement. You know, as a client, it may that you kind of point to your new policy and require compliance. And if your policy isn't created yet, maybe your MSA will state that you reserve the right to provide a policy in the future in the, in, in, and they are going to have to follow that. But in the meantime, maybe pull out a couple concepts and, and that we've discussed today and put it in a provision to cover things about, you know, 
use of client data most specifically, as well as originality of content. As an agency, if you're creating your own agency client agreement, there's two routes you could go. One is the direct route. An agency may explain to the client, if we use AI, it's a really new and unusual thing. It's a great benefit to you, client, but the agency cannot take all of that risk. It's too much risk for each individual client. So client, you're gonna to have to take uh, responsibility if we use AI. Now, of course, a client may not agree to this. So maybe you find some rings placed around this requirement, such as, well, the client only takes responsibility when the agency discloses or when the client approves the use or when the client re requests the use. It all comes down to negotiation. Of course, if you say the word AI in an agency client agreement, everyone's going to get kind of worked up because it's a new and unusual topic. So you could go down a, a less direct uh, route with the understanding that AI will raise these red flags. Some of the things that you could include in the agreement are notes that, hey, certain software providers we use have limitations on the protections that they will give to us, and we can only give to you what we get from those third parties that you recognize client, we don't necessarily have bargaining power over the Microsofts and the AWSs of the world. And so what we get is what you get. You could also note to the client that certain AI platforms or certain software platforms reserve rights to content, either ownership content or the right to allow its users to use it in the future. You're putting the client on notice of these facts so they can't come back to you and complain later. You also might want to put the client on notice if we use certain software programs, AI for you, uh, it may not be owned by ownable by you client or protectable, and there's really nothing that the agency can do about that. So what else? AI provisions in media agreements. You might have read that the Association of National Advertisers recently updated its media template. Um, it provided not much information. It just said AI use should be disclosed in media agreements. Personally, I find that a little bit lacking, especially because they didn't define AI at all. So obviously, you're going to have to make your own determination about how and when you use a provision like this, especially because in media and programmatic, especially AI is used all the time. That's how programmatic works. So to, to say AI, you should be disclosed or to tell a client don't use AI in media buying. That's just not really practical. I think, you know, um, we have to kind of think about the practicalities of how media works. So understanding that AI is already widely used in media buying, it may be better to have the agency and client discuss upfront the type of tools being used and approve on though and agree upon what those uh, tools are. Now, certainly the advertiser would always like the agency to take on the risk of AI, but in the media space, it's generally the advertiser who's providing the advertising content to the media uh, agency, the data that's going to be ingested into the AI, and most often the targeting segments and, and cohorts to be used in purchasing media. So it does make sense in many instances for an advertiser potentially to, at the very least, take responsibility for those aspects. It's at least not unreasonable for an agency to push back on those kinds of issues. Um, so I wanted to um, move on to Liz, who's going to talk a little bit about creating media provisions in for your software developers. Um, but I wanted to hit the CA, CLE code. We still have 15 minutes to get your ethics credit. But right now, CLE code AIP718. Liz, tell us about creating policies for your software developers. Thanks. Yeah, I'm not sure we have a ton of time. So, you know, anyone who wants to talk about how um, open source software and potentially copyleft licenses could be implicated by using AI for code development, please call me. Love to chat about it. Um, but I think just as a quick hit here, there are special considerations for using AI to develop or even debug software. Um, so similar to what Brian was talking about uh, with agencies, um, you will want to, um, just like a lot of companies have development guidelines, uh, it's sort of a similar uh, approach to creating a software developer specific uh, 
uh, AI use guidelines. Um, it's just a bit of a different consideration about types of code or um, data that could be input into the tool, um, as well as what it's been trained on and what it might output in terms of, um, you know, copyrighted material or uh, software that might already be subject to an open source um, or any other license. Um, so the potential IP infringement issue there too. So again, uh, talk to me if you want to chat about it, uh, but I think we should probably move on to the ethics component. Sure. So part of um, that is, Michael, are we seeing clients providing us, I, I mentioned one client that I knew of, but are we seeing clients provide us with policies uh, that, that they're looking to follow? Or is this really covered by ethics rules already in the engagement letter that we already have on file with clients, do you think? Yeah, uh, fair question. Uh, as of this point in time, we've not seen uh, a raft of policies or even communications about this. I think that in part because this is such a new and developing area. And, and yes, you're, you're also right that there's nothing new under the sun. Many of the responsibilities of law firms that may be implicated by the use of AI or generative AI are covered by some of our existing confidentiality uh, and other prescriptions in our ethical rules. However, that doesn't mean necessarily that a policy uh, being implemented by a law firm would not be a good thing. I think we think it is, and that's why we're working on one as we speak. Um, so I, I think relatively few engagement letters cover this issue. It could, um, but I think it is reasonable uh, for clients to inquire uh, of their law firms uh, do you have a policy? Are you thinking of developing one? What is it? And to work with uh, firms collaboratively in order to discover whether that's a tool that should be uh, being used uh, by the law firms uh, in doing a client's work. Thanks, Michael. Um, I wanted to redo the uh, CLE code because people said I spoke too fast. A is an alpha. I is in information, P is in person, 718. It'll be repeated at the end as well. Uh, we do have a slide on enforcing and implementing your AI use policy, but I think we need to get to the ethics. So uh, Michael, can we talk a little bit about the ethical considerations of lawyers using AI and what we've seen out there? Well, you know, first, uh, I, I think people recognize uh, that this is potentially a very useful tool. It can be a useful tool for lawyers, uh, for paralegals uh, who work with lawyers, and even for judges. Um, however, like any tool, using it properly and thoughtfully and with training is necessary. And I think that will necessarily be part of a, a policy uh, that we'll have to consider. So, it's in the future, it's here to stay. Uh, realistically, what I say today may be out of date next week. And so any policy I think needs to be humbly written uh, with those considerations in mind. Uh, the principal concern I think about the use of AI is something that's permeated this, this presentation and it is confidentiality. Uh, what tools are you using? Uh, are they, if it's generative AI, is it something that we can control uh, reasonably such that, you know, clients' confidential information is not disclosed? Um, I think we can move to the next couple of slides. Um, well, yeah, so let's, let's uh, tell us a little bit about uh, what Aon has said. Sure. Well, Aon, uh, which represents probably half of the AMLA 200 law firms, has predictably, you know, uh, at this point, taken a pretty conservative approach. And by the way, that approach has been echoed uh, by GCs around the country who I've seen express the fact that, no, their firm does not, basically prohibits the use of AI or generative AI. Um, and only a few have said, yes, we permit it in these circumstances or the like. But Aon, in essence, su suggested that lawyers right now should not be using it because there are significant issues in terms of uh, accuracy, uh, very concerned about hallucinations and other inaccurate and unreliable 
uh, reports and information that is obtained, as well as the risks of disclosure of client confidential information and copyright considerations. Tough question here. Does that mean that if you do use it in your practice, that Aon's policies won't cover you? As I said to you, we're, we're not giving legal advice on this. Uh, <laughs> CLE. Yeah. But the answer is uh, probably not unless you can be shown to have been grossly negligent in terms of how you proceeded. Uh, you know, this is a, a very new area. I think it underscores the importance for having a policy uh, that would be seen as reasonable and you know well suited to the activity that's being undertaken. But, you know, but at the end of the day, much of this is not terribly unlike the other issues we confront in doing work for clients in a responsible manner. Let's talk about some of the the issues that surround a lawyer actually using it in some of the kind of cases that have in situations that have come up. Do you mind doing that? Well, that's a, maybe that's a good way to focus us. And before we turn to all of the ethical rules, I'll put it in the following context. Uh, it's called Mata uh, versus Avianca. Uh, it was a airline personal injury case. Uh, many of us have heard reports of that case um, to Four law and lawyers uh, wound up getting sanctioned five thousand dollars each, along with their law firm, because they essentially abandoned their professional responsibilities. Uh, one lawyer submitted of, in that firm submitted a brief that turned out to contain non-existent judicial opinions. I've always hoped to be able to create my own opinions. In essence, that's what happened here. Uh, the lawyer did not go back to check the opinions. Uh, ethical violation number one. Uh, and, and number two, when called on it, did not correct the errors that had been made. You know, lawyers make mistakes. Uh, they make mistakes in citing cases sometimes. But in this instance, because the lawyer not only used the chat GPT tool improperly, uh, he failed to correct uh, the errors that had been made. And, and I should say that the, uh, the hearing that was held in this regard was kind of harrowing. Uh, the lawyer admitted that he did not really know what ChatGPT was and used it uh, without any training uh, and uh, obviously uh, without double verifying the information that was obtained. So, you know, bottom line from that case is that lawyers have to very carefully review all of their filings. We've always had to do that. Uh, but if you're going to use, uh, even begin to use other sources to generate information for those filings, uh, you, you you had best make very sure that they're accurate. Um, let's talk let's, about uh, the yeah. Let's talk yeah. about the ABA rules that that actually apply. Does that make sense, Michael? Yes, but you might go back a slide or two. I think right. Yeah. Uh, yes. There we go. Um, these rules uh, again, nothing new under the sun. These are the rules that underscore uh, the ethical responsibilities of all attorneys, outside counsel as well as in house. Uh, attorneys must approach their work with competence. Uh, they must have knowledge of the technologies that they are using. And to operate as the attorneys did in Mata uh, without understanding those tools was clearly a violation of Rule 1.1 competence. And in fact, if you read the judicial opinion, I think that's what the court said. Um, diligence goes right along with competence, and it includes uh, not only uh, Rep properly representing a client, but also exercising independent judgment. If you simply accept what outcome uh, you've received from uh, a generative AI platform, you have not exercised independent judgment. And I think that's an essential point. Uh, these tools can be very useful. You know, if you think about someone who has to do a, a TRO brief uh, overnight, uh, if you can begin with something, it could be very helpful to look at it. But as, as is the case uh, with the use of any form uh, that we've had in the past or template, uh, you must exercise independent judgment and make it your own. Um, rule 1.4, I think, is important with respect to client communication. Uh, there really needs to be a discussion with a client uh, as to the uses at least of certain types of AI, and in particular, where a client's information 
confidential information is going to be used. Um, last, 1.5 is interesting because it really involves the benefits of uh, AI, which is if in fact I can more quickly, efficiently and accurately write a TRO brief in five hours as opposed to 15 through the use of AI, don't I have an obligation uh, to be using those tools? Um, so then there are some other rules, uh, I guess on the next slide we can briefly review. Uh, confidentiality, I think we've covered. Uh, truthfulness in statements to others, I think uh, that really relates in large part uh, to the need when you submit a uh, brief to a court, you basically are certifying the accuracy and truth of its contents. Um, rule 5.1 is important for all lawyers, and that is that the partners in that firm uh, uh, involved in Mata, as well as any lawyer who is supervising uh, staff, has an obligation to uh, engage with that staff, make sure that they're trained, make sure that they're doing their job properly. I think uh, this resolution, you know, which is from a while ago, really calls, uh, you know, speaks for itself and calls for accountability and transparency in the use of systems. And, you know, I think this is going to be an evolving issue. Uh, but again, I think as firms e thoughtfully create policies, which we're in the process of doing, uh, and it's taken a lot of thought, there's been a lot of consideration given to it. And, you know, frankly, certainly concerned, uh, expressed uh, in my office of general counsel about exactly how these things are going to be used. That's, uh, we get back to the CLE code uh, of A is an alpha, I is an information, P is in Paul, 718. Um, happy to answer any questions. There's no other questions in the chat right now. Uh, we do have a minute, so I'm going to answer that consequential dam, uh, that uh, vicarious liability, secondary liability question that was asked earlier uh, that I've written the article on. And, and, and basically it's saying, hey, if I use chat GPT, am I potentially liable for infringement because they're allegedly infringing. And I did the article I wrote was in the context of the FTC new investigation. So it's titled How the Recent Investigation of OpenAI, ChatGPT Will Impact Its Users and Will It Impact Its Users. So FTC uh, uh, recently sent a CID to OpenAI. It doesn't mean that there's any problems going on, but it means it wants more information. And it relates only to open AI. It's not to any of its users. I'd be pretty surprised that if it went broader to a particular user. Um, so a day-to-day -day user of ChatGPT, I'm not sure that the FTC investigation will directly apply to them, but we, there's some good takeaways. The first raised by the investigation is whether open AI has been undertaking uh, basically data collection measures on, on personal information. And we've seen lawsuits where people have already sued OpenAI for them training their data using hundreds of millions of people's data to train its models without consent. And you've probably seen lawsuits from intellectual property owners like Sarah Silverman, who they have sued OpenAI uh, for their intellectual property. This case is more about personal data, but it represents kind of a step towards the protection of the rights of those content or personal information being used without permission to create AI. And, you know, I would say that, um, you know, you have, what, what this says to me is you have to seriously consider how and where the data is coming from if you are creating your own policies, um, but you also want to kind of, I'm sorry, your own software, but you also want to uh, think about the data that, that of course, that, that you are using. Um, the investigation also surrounds whether OpenAI is engaged to uh, deceptive practices towards reputational harm. You might have seen there have been a variety of allegations that ChatGPT responds to prompts about persons, about their lives, their businesses, their personal history, and 
um, allegations that ChatGPT is giving out false information about people, possibly defamatory. There's a lawsuit of a radio host claiming that OpenAI or ChatGPT produced information regarding a, in response to a prompt of a legal complaint that accused him of embezzling money that never occurred. So, you know, I, I do think it's somewhat unlikely the FTC would be interested in an individual company using a single, single individual's information. Uh, you know, this underscores the fact that not all the information you get from ChatGPT is truthful. Um, and the information you do get, especially on people, needs independent verification before you rely on it. Now, not directly applicable, but you should be aware of New York recently enacted a law, the Automated Employment Decision Tool, in that recently came into effect. And it says that employers who rely on AI as part of the hiring process they um, have to submit to independent audits to prove their um, uh, systems aren't biased, and they have to tell candidates that they're using AI. Uh, so I, I do, as I mentioned earlier, think about um, you know the FTC's guidance before about having a policy really may reduce the fact that people uh, that regulators may come after you, uh, and and so I think that helps in this regard. But in terms of vicarious liability, contributory infringement, secondary liability, if you are merely using ChatGPT for one particular use you could get sued for direct infringement. I don't think they need to go to contributory or vicarious. So for example, you go on uh, Mid Journey and you say, create a picture of a dog eating pizza. And that picture that Mid Journey creates um, is an infringement of a third party. I don't think they need to sue you. And yes, they will sue you uh, as a secondary cause of action for vicarious or contributory liability, but they can sue you for direct copyright infringement. You're the one who is making the copy by putting it into your advertising, putting it into your entertainment piece. So I do think there is the potential for liability. And the biggest problem with AI is when we do legal review on materials, um, we always ask, what is your inspiration? That way we can kind of compare your inspiration against what you did. Somebody will give me, well, my inspiration was this YouTube video. And then I'll compare that YouTube video against uh, the, the ad that was created. And while it's somewhat of an inexact science, it's awesome to have that inspiration so I can kind of judge, is it too close or not? But when you're using AI, you have no idea what the AI's inspiration is. And AI is supposed to work, that it's a million different inputs that create that image, so it shouldn't infringe on any one. But we don't know that's really how it works. And without knowing the inspiration that the AI had for that particular image, um, that particular piece of content, it makes legal clearance so much more difficult. That is what I have to say about that. Um, Thank you all for joining. Thanks, Liz, Michael Zweig, David Lampert, Shelly Berry. Uh, and of course, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to any of the presenters. You see the CLE code here. Again, AIP718. Um, this will be recorded and you will get a bounce back with the recording later. The slides will also be in that link. I think that answers most of the questions that you guys are going to have. Thank you all for attending. We are going to be doing another webinar. Don't hang up until you hear about the another, next webinar. There's a new webinar coming up in like two or three weeks on the FTC's endorsement and testimonial guidelines. They finally updated it after like 10 years. And uh, some of our partners, David Mallon, Libby O'Neill, uh, and some other people, maybe even including me, will be presenting on what the updates are and what they mean to you. So thanks all for joining. We appreciate it.